Hi, this is Mike Paulson. Welcome to another one of my Bible study video presentations of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, from a King James 1611 Bible only. And I know people say that all Scripture is given for inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and that is totally true. But you have to also rightly divide the word of truth in the King James 1611 Bible, because all that Bible is there for us, but not all of it is to us for specific doctrines or corrections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we've got to learn to deal with that. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, the scriptures are plain and simple, shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness, who concerning the truth have erred. So we have to make sure that we rightly divide that King James Bible. Don't try to apply the Ark. Don't try to apply the Commandments. Don't try to apply the Hebrew books and Peter, because those are written to the Jews. And Paul's books, as you will see here, as you always have seen, if you watch any of my presentations or heard any of my sermons, we look to according to, according to the Apostle Paul, only as far as application to us. For so God hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. That's Paul's calling. Teaching the simplicity that is in Christ, as it says in Corinthians, but I fear, lest any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And we will be talking about that a little bit today, the simplicity that has been destroyed and confused by professors and colleges and pastors and everybody here. Anyway, teaching the simplicity that is in Christ by presenting Paul's greater commission, as he says also, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth, which now to the Gentiles supersedes the great commission in Mark 16, because that was a Jewish thing that was done back in Jesus. Anyway. Let's just not bunny trail this stuff. You know me. I could easily do that. During the dispensation of the grace of God, it says in Ephesians, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. It's Paul's ministry is to take to us the, the uh, his greater commission to the ends of the earth, during this dispensation of the grace of God, compared to the severity of God that the Jews had to live through and will again live through during their tribulation, emphasizing the goodness of God, or despisest thou the riches, Paul says, in, of his goodness, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You can't scare people to God. It doesn't work. It didn't work with the Jews, but it's going to go back to the Jews in the tribulation. Gentiles, he gives us his goodness. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. And please note, he is talking to the Gentile nation. He's not, gonna, he's not talking about an individual Christian who doesn't obey God or his pastor, and then he eventually loses his fellowship with God. God cuts off the fellowship. That has nothing to do with Romans chapter 11. He's talking about the nation, the Gentile nation, talking about the Jewish nation. And on them which fell severity, that's the Jews. Toward thee, Gentiles, goodness. And once the Gentiles are done with the goodness of God, which you've heard me say is only taught by Paul, which you've heard me say can only be found in a King James Bible, and the Gentile nation will then be cut off when they're done with it, and that's when the tribulation starts, and that's when the rapture wraps, as they like to call it. But we might as well just call it what it is. It's when the Gentile nation gets cut off. Today's presentation is just a short commentary to help clear my desk of a stack of yellow sticky notes that are always on my mind. They piled up and piled up, but they just haven't made it to full presentation status. Actually, keeping these sticky notes short, 
as you know me, is, is a challenge for me, even though I will enjoy finally having them off my desk. I believe I need to always fill my observational thoughts with scriptures to back up those thoughts, comments, frustrations, the excitement, the joy, the assurances, uh, what they like to call uh, conceit and arrogance. But no, it's, it's assurance in the scriptures or ev even reminders for us all, making sure they aren't just my own flash in the pan opinions. To me, if I can't be reminded of scriptures when I make my daily observations, then my own thoughts are just a waste of brain activity and proving that I am just growing into a hyper grumpy, forgetful, aging curmudgeon. And maybe that's, that's happening anyway. But here we go. Let's look at a few of my thoughts here. We often hear people say, well, I guess it wasn't just my time to go. Or they talk about how we all have a specific appointment as to when we will die. Once again, we see what the modern Bibles and pastors have done with the truth. Hebrews 9.27, which, by the way, is written to the Jews, but it's also a fact of all time, as you'll see. That's why we still teach uh, Genesis to Revelation, that whole scripture is the comfort of the scriptures. It's all there for us. It's just that Paul's books are the only ones to us. But anyway, Hebrews 9.27 says, says that we are all going to die someday. That's what it says. It does not say we have a specific appointment. And the verse says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So we're not, we don't have an appointment to die, because if that were to be the case, then people would wonder why God allowed my husband or my wife or my children to suffer so much before they died. Is that God's will? No, it's not God's will. Uh, it's a long, that's another sermon in itself, but this gets it off my chest as far as people make it, saying that God has an appointment. Well, it's just not your time to die, Henry, and you're just going to have to suffer for a year. What kind of a God would do that to you? We live in a, in a cursed world, and we are not promised any rescue during the time we're here. And we get cancer, we get stuff, we die, and it might take a long time. It's not a pleasant thought. But we certainly can't blame God for it. But if you think your death is an appointment and you have to suffer for a year or two, is it no wonder people think this whole God thing is just baloney? Because it would be if that's the way God is. It's not. Oh, it's just one of those things here. Let's look at another one. In and into. Boy, this, this is one of my pet peeves. As our educational level crumbles in America, we are seeing a lot more incorrect spellings and misuse of words in articles and news pieces everywhere. In means you're already in whatever it is you are in. Into means the process of going into something. You aren't jumping in the shower, for example, unless you were dumb enough to try to jump in the shower while you're already in there. But then if you want to be even dumber, you can try to jump into the shower. That's how that works, where you're almost guaranteed to slip on your way into the shower, of course, to touch a humor attempt there. But in and into, he jumped in the river. No, he jumped into the river. Okay, let's just keep moving along here. Judgment is spelled with an E, just one. British version is spelled with that extra E, but this is America, not Britain. Here in America, we spell judgment, J-U-D-G-M-E-N-T and not J-U-D-G-E-M-E-N-T. If you want to spell it with that extra E, then get back onto the Mayflower and go home. Uh, now that we're going global, I suppose you can use either one, but I just like to do what we do in that 1611 Bible. No E. I suppose you've noticed the last couple of years, there's been a big push for the Ten Commandments to be put back into schools, into government offices, stores, lobbies, etc. Now, I understand why they want to go that way, but they are still incorrect in their application and source. Obviously, most don't know the real truth about those tablets. Well, A, they were given to Moses and the Jews only, while the heathen, Gentiles, that's us, uh, compared us to dogs, we're judged by our conscience, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, which is why Paul tells Timothy that the Gentiles' conscience is seared. So as written, they were just given to Moses and the Jews. B, the Jews were still expected to follow them in the Gospels, because the Gospels are still Old Testament doctrine. Hebrews 9, 16 again, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. 
for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So while they're teaching Jesus' teachings to the Jews today, uh, those are teachings before Jesus died. So those teachings today have no strength. They're just a waste of teaching. We look to Jesus' teachings after the death of the testator. Makes total sense. C, today we are to follow the commandments of God as given to Paul, not Moses. In Corinthians, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So you follow Paul for the commandments while Paul does reiterate those commandments in his teachings, he does leave one out. He leaves out, remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He does? Yes, yes. Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day. Holiday, holy day, or, the new, or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. You do a quick word study on the word commandment, to understand why we have no special Sabbath or church day today. Saturday or Sunday for the special day of rest out of God, not required. Good idea, take a day off, go to go, go to the lake or whatever, uh, but it's nothing what we've made it out to be, and certainly is not the argument between different churches. Saturday is Sabbath, all that kind of stuff. Oh, well. Well, let's go a little bit more in depth. Now, those are just kind of like pet peeves here. These are worthy of a complete study and sermon presentation, which some of these I have done, but these are just good reminders because I hear about them all the time. I see them every day. Spoken word versus the written word. This is a huge dividing line in Christianity today. One side is actually completely void of God's words and is completely misunderstood and mistaught by almost all pastors and is considered profane and vain babblings by the risen Christ. It only came in part then, but today it is completely in Satan's deceptive control. The other side is 100% God's inspired, inerrant, preserved, living, face-to-face, -to -face, totally irrelevant written words today, and is that which is perfect, that came to us in full and has been attacked by Satan since its beginning, so far, with no success. No complete success, put it that way. He's had great success in getting rid of the King James Bible out of the churches and out of your homes, but he still the, the King James Bible still exists. It's still available. We still have it available today, but only for a little while longer, as we are nearing Amos 8, 11 through 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Scary thought. The spoken word appears to be scripturally appropriate, because it does appear in John 14, 26, and 1 John 2, 20 and 27, as the anointing, and the unction given to them from God himself. Naturally, you would think that if you read these verses for your first time, or because your pastor said that you have that anointing and unction because you were born again, these are the verses, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And then in 1 John, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Or, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Unfortunately, for these people today, nobody has told them, and because they seldom read their Bibles other than a few favorite verses, but those verses were from Jesus speaking to the Jews, not the Gentiles. Jesus actually told the apostles to not take that doctrine to the Gentiles, but that anointing and that unction will happen again during the tribulation. The King James Bible will be in famine. God will speak to those that, are, that he has chosen to speak to, 
et cetera, et cetera. It's worth it. I got a sermon out there on that thing. But uh, when you try to talk to people today that believe they believe they've been anointed, God teaches them everything. You know, if they really believe that, then they wouldn't even have to go to church. They wouldn't even have to listen to their pastor. They just, God just tells them. And I have heard people say, I ask, ask him, well, how do you know the truth? Well, God tells me. Yeah, but he's told you and Frank and Fred and Billy and Mary, told you all different things. How can that be? Well, I just know. I tell you, this whole, this is spoken words, what they're following today. And of course, the highly educated pastor has convinced his people to follow his spoken words from his use of Hebrews 13, 7 and 13, for his power control verses. And they teach this, remember them which have the rule over you, that's the pastor, see, who has spoken unto you the word of God. See, he knows the word of God, but you don't, see. He's been to school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Who has spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. So follow what he does, considering the end of their conversation. Adds more to it in verse 13. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Submit yourselves to your pastor. Have you ever heard that? For they watch for your souls. I don't watch for anybody's soul. Once they're saved, that's, their soul is in God's hands. I will try to talk to people, talk to them about their soul or about salvation. But I'm not watching for their soul once they put their faith in the risen Savior. As they must give account. Oh, here we go. Here's the guilt trip. For they watch for your souls. As they must as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. So see, if you're not obeying your pastor and you're having some rough times, but you're not but your pastor's not happy with you, it's it's gonna fall back on you because your pastor is supposed to be a pastor and minister with joy, not with grief. And if he is, it's unprofitable for you. Talk about a guilt trip. Those are to the Hebrews in the coming tribulation. Read those verses in any modern Bible. You'll, you'll see what they've done with that stuff. Or I'll just ask your pastor. He'll talk you out of this stuff. He'll tell you, of course you have to. Of course you should obey me. And some are more strict than others, but they're out there. So people who hang out in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or the Tribulation books, Hebrews through Jude, for their doctrine, you know, Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount, Lord's Prayer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, listen only to the spoken word from their pastor, author, or televangelist, YouTube couch pastor, and boy, there are gazillions of those out there, or musician even today. But most of the time, they're just listening to themselves, and they're not hearing God's words. They're hearing the voice of a stranger, Satan himself. Besides, they don't read, study, or believe any Bible, so they cannot be taught. Bible means nothing to them these days. God has shown them. The pastor, the book, the author, the musician, the words they hear, that's what they're following. And the words that come to them in their pretty little minds. Now, the written word, the complete opposite teaching of the spoken word is to follow a written Bible. Of course, people today would ask, how can there be one Bible when there are over 300 various Bibles on the market today? Well, good question, actually. But they, these are people today who have only grown up in the confusion of Christianity. Don't even realize that there was a time that the King James Bible was the majority Bible not only in America, but in the world. They just believe the spoken word from their pastor. That pastor attacks and criticizes the King James Bible. People say they don't like the King James Bible, but they don't know why. They just know their pastor, bookstore clerk, family member has all told them, no, nah, we reject. It's too hard to read. It's archaic uh, contradictions. It all can be explained. It's just what they've been taught. The King James Bible can be proven to be God's inspired, yes, inspired and preserved words that came in 1611 and written in the universal language, English. It can be proven historically through manuscript evidence, through rightly divided doctrine, eliminates all contradictions, through the attack and hatred it has endured from Satan and his followers. You look at any history of any of these other modern Bibles, None of them have gone through the attack and the bloodshed and the torture 
that the King James Bible went through and the people that had one. As well as having proved itself to be relevant right up to today, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Revelation 13, Revelation 18. It's all, it's all happening. Not bad for a book that's 400 years old. When compared to modern Bibles or other language Bibles, they have changed or deleted thousands of words with serious doctrines, having been redone to modern New Age satanic doctrine. They are harder to read. King James Bible used to be considered a fifth grade reading level, but now most college people and even adults can barely read any grade level. But it was, it was a fifth grade reading book. They are written and published by corrupt and perverted people. NIV, uh, I'll stay away from the sermon. They teach another Jesus. They teach you to imitate Christ and to follow the Antichrist. They rob people of God's promise to preserve his words. Their purpose is to make money. And the list goes on and on. But what's wrong with these modern Bibles? There are three verses that seal the deal when it comes to truth from the written, inspired, and preserved words of God. First of all, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the key there is scripture. And the other key there is we have to remember that we need to rightly divide the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babbling, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So you can't just apply Genesis to Revelation. You apply Romans to Philemon. That's written to us Gentiles. I know you've heard me say this, but people don't seem to be getting it. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's there for us. How else do you learn about Jesus' life on the earth? But those that's not doctrine to us. That is not our reproof. That is not the instruction and in righteousness we need to look to. We look to Paul. The absolutely most serious and important verses that show written truth today, which differentiates Old Testament, tribulation, Jewish-only doctrine of the past, and for the future, tribulation concerning the severity of God, from the Gentile-only doctrine from the risen Savior teaching the goodness of God, proving the division in today's Christianity from Christ to Satan, and it's proven in that arrival of that which is perfect. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you've heard me say this. Remember, this is also a presentation of reminders. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. And that's the way it was during Paul's time. That's the way it was before the King James Bible. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part, that's the Gospels, that's all the tribulation books, that's all the stuff that the Jews were being taught, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And that's what grabbing onto a King James Bible really is. You're becoming a mature adult. You're becoming a man. You, you become not tossed around by a child anymore. For now, during Paul's time, we see through a glass darkly, you know, in part. They can barely see stuff, but they can see some of it. But then, when that which is perfect has come, face to face. It's like talking to Jesus' face, because we got his mouth right here, his words right here. For I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. You know this is Paul? You can, sure, of course you know this is Paul. He's the one talking to you. And that's how much we can know what God has for us about the risen Savior, about the world, and about teachings, understanding, scriptures, etc., etc. you got to, got to notice when you're reading through that stuff that Paul is talking about then and then in the future. Then and in the future. The future is when that which is perfect is come. And by the way, it cannot be the coming of Jesus Christ because if it is, first of all, the first Jesus Christ already came. It can't be the second one because if it is, then all that stuff, the knowledge and the tongues and the prophecies are only still in part. And we can go by the spoken word. So 
you know, if, if it's not the King James Bible, then we all just have religion because everybody's thinking that God's telling them certain stuff. And God tells different people different things. What kind of dumb philosophy is that? It's just we, we want to be we want to stand on confidence and assurance that we have the word of God. So that which is perfect is come. And perfect, by the way, in the scriptural definition means it's finished, it's completed. It's perfect, it's done. Nothing common anymore. That's you know, it's all there, it's all done. You want to know God face to face, you study that Bible, rightly divide it. You can understand as much as you study. It takes a while. You don't get it the first night of reading, but it takes you just read and you study. And when you study, by the way, you show thyself approved unto God. You don't learn how to just do everything to be blessed by God. You find out that you are already now approved unto God. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Oh, I've got stuff to be ashamed of. But no, you don't. Christ took care of that. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And if it's not rightly divided to Paul only, it's profane and vain babblings. Okay, I know I'm just jab jabbing here. After what has been going on these last three years with what they now call exact science, another one of my thoughts here, we should understand even more today why God says what he says about trusting science. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. There you go, pastors with their modern teachings today, and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. And I know year, years ago, we wonder why is science so bad? It's just talking about fossils. Evolution was, was really stupid. So that was a big deal. But now we're hearing about science and the mark and the, and the vaccine and all sorts of things about this exact science, you know, gender bending and all that stuff. And now it's all based on science. It's not based on science. That is science falsely so-called. And lastly, for today's presentation, people who call themselves Christians are more than willing to say they believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again. Well, they all say that. Yet, this, this, this puzzles my little brain here, yet they are completely ignorant of his teachings after he rose again. In fact, when they do hear Paul's words of the risen Christ that Paul talked to face to face with Jesus himself, they outwardly reject and even hate those wonderful words. They hate the goodness of God, which is why Romans 11.22 says, when, when the Gentiles are done with the goodness of God, then the Gentile nation is going to be cut off. Not the individuals, the Gentile nation. Those that have the goodness of God and trust the risen Savior, we will be gone when he cuts off the Gentiles. That's when the Spirit of God leaves, and that's when we leave with the Spirit of God, because we are sealed in the Spirit. If we leave, he leaves. If he leaves, we leave. Ephesians 1.13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, right around 12, 13, 14, uh, 8, 9, 8, 9, and 10 in there. So when, when God says, okay, Gentiles, you had your chance. I gave you absolutely everything on a platter. I even gave you my faith. You just had to give me your faith. And he gives us everything in return. When the Gentiles don't want that, it's over. It's not based on the falling away of signs and the wonders. All, things have been falling away in this nation for years. And looking to the falling away in the signs of the day-to-day -day affair, that's looking for signs. What we're looking for, the, great, the falling away, is the falling away of the truth, the falling away of the King James Bible, the falling away of the teachings of the risen Savior to the Gentiles. That's the falling away. And everybody's done with that. God's going to be done with them. That's what it's based on. And there are people that still enjoy the King James Bible. They still seek to learn from that Bible. They still seek the goodness of God. They still need to hear the, the uh, rightly dividing the word of truth because they've never heard it before. And God knows they're going when they hear it, they're going to go for it. And uh, uh, Adrian and you folks, you got people out there interested. So as long as we can find people interested, we're not going anywhere. I believe Satan has taken these people captive into his snare at his will because all these people oppose themselves that the scriptures say and their simple hearts have been led astray by their deceived and deceiving evil seducing pastors then led to another Jesus and Paul warns about that. Okay. That ends it except here are some things that are on my desk still. I didn't clear my whole desk off here yet. 
Have you been reading in the mainstream news all the miracles and wonders going on, such as coming back from the dead? Almost daily in the news. Have you noticed that? And more and more miraculous healings? Are they true? Are they from God or Satan? They're from Satan. And I'll show you the scripture sometime. What is it that is falling away in order for the great falling away to be considered the actual falling away that brings on the rapture and the time of great tribulation by cutting off the Gentiles? Well, I just told you, it's a falling away of the truth. The truth has been made into a lie. The truth is in a King James Bible spoken only by Paul to the Gentiles. I mean, the King James Bible, Genesis, the revelation is truth, but based on based on dispensations. And so when that's all over with, that's what the falling away is. It's not about how bad, how, how life has gotten so bad. Those are signs and those are happening. And we see more and more clues of the tribulation, but that's not what we're counting on. In other words, how bad will it get? No, we're looking at how much more do will people hate the King James Bible rightly divided by looking to Paul? That's what that's what the bottom line is. And when the Gentiles are done, God's done with the Gentiles. Why Christians look forward more to their own disappearing rather than love his appearing? I'll talk about that sometime. Basically, they have no idea what Christ did to the Gentiles. He has no idea what he did to us. You know, we're dead to the law. We're dead to sin. Uh, they're still dead in their sins. And all these things, the goodness of God, they have none of those goodnesses of God are in the gospel teaching. None of those are talked about in churches. So why would they love his appearing? They just want to get out of here. Life has gotten kind of hard and cruel. No, Paul says that that, that crown is for those that love his appearing. So why wouldn't they love his appearing? They don't even know him. And if they do know him, they still know nothing about the goodness of God because they're not reading their scriptures or hearing from a guy that talks about the scriptures being rightly divided. Hint, hint. Anyway. Another Jesus or the real risen Jesus Christ? Which one do you have? Which one is making the big global revival worship scene today? Have you heard about that? Can you prove your Jesus with scriptural assurance and not just your personal feelings or what your pastor says because of his education? We'll be looking at more in depth and details about the goodness of God as taught only by Paul and found only in the King James Bible. I think we've got about 140 left to go over. I'll get back to that here very quickly. Here, I hear that it is us who confidently and with assurance follow the risen Savior through Paul in the King James Bible, we are the ones they consider conceited and arrogant. Seriously? It is from them who think they walk good enough to be blessed by God physically. It is them who reject everything Jesus said after he died and rose again. It is them who think they are anointed and have the unction of God, so they don't even need a Bible. And it's all based on their walk. We're, we're speaking confidently and with assurance that the Bible says, you know, the scriptures say, and they hate that. And they think that our confidence and knowledge and understanding is, is conceited and arrogant. Seriously? This is one that really does bother me. It really gets to me. Because you are the people that think that you're being blessed by God because you walk so good. Wow. Amazing. No, you are the conceited and arrogant ones. And that's exactly what it says in Hebrews 11.25, by the way. Anyway, the attack on the simplicity that is in Christ by evil, seducing, deceiving, being deceived, educator, professors, and pastors. But I fear, Paul says, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And just recently, I did some looks into, into exegesis and hermeneutics and all this kind of stuff. Boy, I'll tell you, these guys and their education, they have so confused people with all these books and articles and thousands and thousands of YouTube preachers and teachers and people that know what God, what they know what God told them. None of them, hard, hardly any of them talk about rightly dividing the truth. And if they do talk about rightly dividing the truth, they do it based on their pastor's teachings to them. It's not still talking about Paul only. If they use Paul, well, they're just a Paul user. 
They are not teaching Paul only. They still want to have a church. They still want to go back to the old church design. They still want to do the music thing, and they're going to get. They're just getting caught up in this new scene. It's amazing to me, and yet people follow these guys all the time, and they just confuse everybody. You just need to be reading your King James Bible rightly divided. There's some interesting things out there about the tribulation coming and the mark and the money system and the and the you know all the stuff that's going on. It's interesting to read that stuff, but boy, don't get caught up in that stuff. It's robbing you from the simplicity that is in Christ. You've all heard me say that before anyway, so let's just keep going here. And then, maybe you've heard about this, what about this new Jesus worship excitement that started recently at Kentucky's Asbury University and has taken the world by storm with hundreds of thousands of worshipers worshiping their unknown God, as Paul puts it, with all kinds of music, as it says in Daniel. It is even being marketed as a global awakening revival. And then the latest event was this past weekend in New York City, Times Square. God is love takeover, bringing the spirit of revival to Times Square. Is that the risen Savior? Not at all. That is so exciting because that is that is revelation. They're getting a global worship together to worship Satan. That must mean he's getting ready to come or be revealed so he can be worshipped because the global worship team is getting getting it all put together. All kinds of music. That's the good stuff as well as the bad stuff. How can the good stuff rob you? Easy. You still listen to the good, simple, clean hymns or the classic music or stuff, and you're still not reading your Bible. Satan can still get you out of that book. If you truly have Christ as your Savior, Satan still wants you to keep you from learning. And the more you follow YouTube and the more you follow these guys and read this stuff and listen to your music all the time, you're, you're robbing yourself of learning about the simplicity that is in Christ. It amazes me, but Satan is not stupid. He's not giving up, that's for sure. Then you hear this one, turning from sin. So my question to these pastors are, so how does one turn from sin? as we keep reading and hearing about in these Christian news magazines. Saw that at the doctor's office the other day. We need, America needs to turn from sin. What good would that do? Can we even turn from sin? Have you turned from sin? You know what Christ has done to you regarding sin? Uh, Romans chapter 6. It's a fantastic study. Don't get caught up. He's not talking about sinning. He's talking about sin as a noun. We are dead to sin. Sin is still in us, and it's doing it. We now, got, we, now we have the opportunity to, to choose. Do we follow the sin that's within us, or do we follow righteousness and say no? Just say no. Remember that one years ago? Okay, so turn from sin. And which kind of brings me up to this. Oh, I, I'll get to that one here in a minute here. Why do Christians use God's name in vain, by the way? Oh, God, this is good. Let's use this name in vain. In vain means it's used for no purpose. And I hear Christians all the time, you know, you can say, gosh, is Christian swearing, but it really isn't, you know, but they say, God, this is a good day. I hear that all the time from these so-called Christians. But see, God hasn't, apparently hasn't told them not to use his name in vain. In the scriptures, it says not to use his name in vain. But hey, you know, we're, we're in a dispensation of the grace of God. If we use it, I guess we can, but you ought not to be because uh, it's using his name in vain. But I hear it all the time. It's just one of my pet peeves here. Now, going back to turning from sin, do a word study on the word attain, and you can learn some startling yet marvelous conclusions. You know, we attained unto righteousness as a nation, but individually, even Paul says he hadn't attained. He hasn't walked the perfect walk. Romans chapter 7 sure expo explores and explains that one. So these people, again, think they're blessed because they have turned from sin in their own physical fleshly walk and they think we are the arrogant ones you could tell i like to just rattle on here and just i'd like to get a church so i wish one of these churches say hey mr paulson would you come and give us a preach today because our pastor is sick oh i would love to come and talk to you folks not gonna happen today's gospel church the judgmental crowd and boy are they a judgmental crowd is taught Living godly will get you blessed by God. And that's their whole point, see? Paul teaches that you will suffer persecution if you live godly in Christ Jesus. 
This is the hard thing for the people that get a hold of rightly dividing. You learn to follow Paul's teachings. You tell people you're following Paul. You're following uh, King James Bible, rightly divided. Uh, many of us have lost jobs over it. We have lost family. We have lost friends. We have lost almost everything because we stick to Paul. We stick to that King James Bible. So if you want to live godly in any form at all, you're going to suffer persecution. And we have to decide how much can we take before we you know, decide to serve the flesh and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a tough deal. And yet these people out there are uh, believing that if they do the right thing and live godly according to their pastor and according to their feelings, not to lie, da-da-da-da, that's why they dress with all these old-fashioned clothes. Kind of, they think they're being modest, but the other part of being modest is a lady who isn't loud. That's that's immodest too, by the way. A loud woman, at Timothy chapter five, or is it chapter two? I forget. It's it's a dangerous one for pastors to preach. They usually don't. So they all they can all they can improve on is doing better. We, as following Paul, we can learn more about what Christ has done to us. And as we grow up and learn these true doctrines, we choose to stop doing some of the things that we know we shouldn't be doing. Growing up, like Paul says in Ephesians 4, uh, you know, a child tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Well, we won't be once you get a hold of Paul's teachings. And that's why, I, I'll bring this up again, that's why people who are watching YouTube, looking for those preachers that'll that'll preach a message they like to hear, the guys that have the big whiteboards and the charts, and they say they follow Paul, but they don't. It didn't take long to find that out. Um, they, they're they trying to build that church still. They're still caught up in the church age. And as a result of that stuff, um, you can actually be blessed physically by Satan because, hey, I got my found a vis I found a, I found a good guy. I'm going to follow him and send him my money, and uh, we're going we're gonna to be a happy family. No, it's tough to stick with a Paul following, uh, right, the dividing Paul only preacher guy. Send your money to him if you want to send your money to anybody. But uh, they'll preach that they need the money to build their internet church. They'll need the money to build their church church. That's that's not the case with me. I just need money to survive. <laughs> As do you. Pay the bills. Okay. And then last, I've already said it once. Oh, here's my favorite one. I cannot wait to do this particular sermon here. Whose works work? I'm not going to say anything else as much as I could probably do the sermon right here and now. Whose works work? I'll be doing that one fairly soon because I just have it on my, my itchy chest to get off. Because, okay, now, whose works work? Maybe you can figure it out. Whose works work? What are you talking about? And then I threw this in. I forgot I had already said it once, but we're going to talk more about the goodnesses of God. Okay. This is the end. If you've seen this before, then you can just stop it right here. But if not, I'll finish it up here. The inspired God breathed Holy Scriptures, the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, the words of the Lord, and the word of God, inspire, inspirationally preserved, inherently written for and given to the Gentile nation, to fulfill 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10, that which is perfect, it came in 1611. When that which is perfect came, then that which was in part was done away. Now, as Gentiles, we can put away childish things. And as a church of God, which is what Paul calls a saved person, not a denomination, saved, quickened Gentile, we can know even as also I am known. We can know that much. Remember, Paul did speak in tongues at first. He did baptism at first. There's reasons for that. But now it's all done away. It's gone. It was then and still is today, King James 1611 Bible. It can and should be our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. It is no longer a book of law. It is a book of pleasing God. How to please God. How to understand what you're going through. How to understand what's going on in this world. It's not just a book of laws. Study the show thyself for proved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Remember, it's about the risen Christ, the Apostle Paul, the goodness of God, the dispensation of the grace of God. Also remember that the unction and anointing that came before the King James Bible came only in part to the Jews, only to the Jews, but the King James Bible came in full for and to the Gentiles. Eventually, that unction and anointing will return, not to us, but only during the coming of the time of great tribulation. How do we know this? Because verse 8 talks about a the King James Bible uh, will go into, go into hiding in a famine status and will be a hated and illegal book. So you might want to hide those King James Bibles you want to save for your family. Uh, because there's going to come a day where America is going to make that book illegal. And if your kids are caught with it, then uh, they're going to have their cells beheaded, which is in Roman Revelation chapter 4, I think it is. And they got a special reward waiting for them, uh, tribulation people that get killed during the tribulation for the word of the for the word of God. But I, I, I just didn't go now myself. I just want to see him now. Um, one more side light here. Do you realize that King James Bible? Because it's written, and there it is in your hands, inspired, preserved to this day, to this generation, as he says, we can we can know about the tribulation now more than the people will know during the tribulation. They will not have a King James Bible to consult, and God will be showing them things uh, as, as they go through their prophets and through their uh, functioning and anointing. But we can sit down and study the King James Bible. Now, if they happen to find a King James Bible somewhere, they can read what's going on in that time of tribulation. And Paul will not be the apostle to look to. It'll be Peter, James, it'll be the apostle doctrine. Jude, James, Peter, John. That's the stuff. And then they, they read. They could read in Revelation that they're going to have to have the patience of the saints, and they're going to have to not take the mark, because if they read in Hebrews chapter 6, they'll read that if they take the mark, they cannot get it back. They cannot get back to God. That's just, it's over and done with them, they take the mark. All sorts of things in Hebrews to Jude. But that's the stuff there for us. Passing on to the people who think that they want to go through the tribulation, I guess. Okay, back on track. Well, believe it or not, take it or leave it, deal or no deal, use it before you lose it. Don't believe what your pastor says about the King James Bible. Read it and study it for yourself. Just make sure you're rightly divided according to Paul. No bouncing back and forth with different di different dispensations for different verses. That's what the pastors try to teach. And that's not true. You look to Paul. He is our apostle. Peter is the apostle to the Jews, Galatians chapter 2. It really is that simple. I, I keep talking so much, it sounds complicated, I suppose. But it's really simple. Listen, I, you know, uh, since 1950, I suppose since 1958 uh, or 59, I've been involved with music. And then I get involved with, with studying the Bible over the years. If I, can, if I can learn this stuff as a musician, this stuff is not difficult. But I've been through the church scene so many times in religion that I know how confusing they make it. I just wish people would catch on today. By the way, I'll say it again. Today's global awakening of worship revival is actually preparing the whole world to worship Satan with all kinds of music, that's good and bad, as he will soon be coming to earth seeking whom he may devour, demanding global worship. And that old mark of the beast, 666, www so he can be like the Most High. And there's your references right there. So, believe it or not. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.